Thank you very much for joining us for the very first episode of the Lake Anna podcast. My name is Grayson Hoffman. I'm a Lake Anna resident, a Lake Anna real estate agent, and a real estate investor here at Lake Anna. Our goal in bringing you this podcast is to bring you something new and fresh about Lake Anna, something that is all things Lake Anna. Lake Anna culture, current events and news, Lake Anna real estate information, businesses, entertainment, events, food, water sports, wildlife, you name it. Bottom line, our goal is to provide you with useful, helpful, and entertaining information about Lake Anna. So thank you for tuning in, and I hope you enjoy the Lake Anna podcast. Welcome to the Lake Anna podcast. Today's guest is Stuart Morris. Stuart, I'll just say, has a very impressive resume. Let's just cut to the chase and say that Stuart is a top dog at the North Anna Power Station. <laughs> Technical term, the position that Stuart holds today, he is the Director of Safety and Licensing at the North Anna Power Station, Dominion Energy here at Lake Anna. Like I said, one of the top dogs. Stuart has been at the North Anna Power Station, aka NAPS for the insiders here, they call it NAPS, for 33 years. It's a long time. Before his current position at the North Anna Power Station, Stuart has held just about every other job possible, I think, at NAPS. Some of those include, prior to this job, he was the Director of Nuclear Engineering. Prior to that, he was the Manager of Design Engineering. He was also the manager of engineering programming. Prior to that, he was the supervisor of auxiliary systems engineering at NAPS. He was also the supervisor of ISI materials engineering. What is ISI? If it's, there's a short answer it, to that. It stands for in-service inspections. Okay. So you were a supervisor of that at one point in time. You were actually on the uh, also on the corrective action group. Correct. Kind of sounds sinister in some ways. It's like the uh, disciplinarian group for bad NAPS employees. Uh, not exactly. You, you'll get a visit from the corrective action group That's if right. you <laughs> if you were late. Uh, we'll we'll come back to that and give you uh, an opportunity to to share factual information. Uh, you were also at one point in time a shift technical advisor, senior reactor operator at NAPS. You were also an operations engineer. You were also at one point in time a maintenance engineer at NAPS. Stuart was educated at the University of Virginia, right down the road here in Charlottesville, where you obtained a degree in nuclear engineering. Easy stuff. You were born and raised in Orange County, Virginia, also right down the road, home of President James Madison. Correct. You are married with three kids, two sons and a daughter. That's all correct. For fun, Stuart, uh, sounds like he fights fires. You are and continue to be a volunteer firefighter at Orange County, Virginia, 40 plus years. That's correct. And it sounds like for fun, you're also a superhero. You fly around saving people from uh, certain disaster and doom. I'm not sure about the flying part. This is, uh, you know, Scott, your uh, media manager, uh, mentioned that you were a, a humble guy. And I can see that now already. But I'm glad that he provided this resume because this is, uh, this is re really impressive. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you much. very much for your time. Thanks for coming. My first and perhaps most most important question is, is this. Why is it after I swim in Lake Anna, I get out, my skin glows for 15 to 20 minutes? Uh, I hope that doesn't occur. <laughs> Uh, just just for anybody not no, familiar with Lake Anna, that's a joke. It's there, a bad joke yeah. that my skin does not glow. Yeah, there's no way that that uh, <laughs> could occur from anything from our plant, at right. least. You know, right, right. What other activities you may be doing right. while you're it's causing my skin to glow? Could, that could be right, something right. else. But, uh, well, in all seriousness, so what uh, what are you working on uh, at NAPS right now? What's what's on your plate? My job primarily is to main, make sure that we operate in accordance with all of our rules and regulations, both from the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, other federal agencies such as FERC and OSHA and all of those, plus all the state and local jurisdictions also. So anything that has to do with uh, any regulations whatsoever, they fall under me or my group at this time. So it's a constant making sure that we're doing the right thing to operate the plant. 
That's a big job. But like, you know, today or tomorrow, what was an example of something that you're, what's a project that you have going on or some, what were you doing before you walked out over here? We always start the day with a series of morning meetings to catch up with where the status of the plan is and, and the activities that are going on during the day. So that Mm -hmm. was, that's always the start of my day. And then it moves into a series of meetings and a series of uh, other activities. It could be walk downs and could be uh, observations of work, uh, different types of things or meetings where we have to uh, evaluate certain activities that are coming up to make sure they're suitable and they're being done in a safe manner. A lot of meetings. Yes, <laughs> my, my position has a lot of meetings. Right, as, as a boss, I'm, sh- I'm sure it does. Um, let's shift topics and you've been there a long, a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to talk a bit about the, the history of Lake Anna. Can you just generally lay out, well, let me back up for anyone that doesn't know and is listening or watching Lake Anna is a man made lake, correct? Correct. Made in what year? Started in the late sixties. Okay. Basically when the permission was to obtain to build a nuclear power plant here in mm-hmm. Mineral. They started with, they needed a cooling water supply, and that's what generated Lake Anna. Okay. Um, basically, there was a North Anna River, which was more than, just a little more than a creek wow. at the time. Okay. And uh, we built a dam facility, mm-hmm. and then based on two remnants of hurricanes, filled the lake very quickly up to its uh, current uh size okay uh the the lake is about thirteen thousand acres it has over 200 miles of shoreline and down near the dam it's uh it's very deep it gets deep yeah yes. before we dive into the lake and, and i want to and we're going to talk about you know how it works and i want to rest on your expertise i can't wait to ask you a few more questions some, some of the technical questions but um so this is a nuclear power plant right correct can you just, I have a very simple mind, um, can, can you just take, you know, 60 seconds and explain what is nuclear power and, and how it works? And, and then we're going we're gonna to apply that to the lake here and kind of get into some specifics, but, but just generally speaking, nuclear power. Basically, the difference between a nuclear power plant and any other steam-driven turbine power plant is the heat source. And, okay. and the heat source for us comes from a nuclear reaction inside a reactor vessel. We fission atoms, and that produces heat. We use that heat to generate steam, and then the steam turns the turbines and produces the uh, electrical uh, power. You mentioned that Lake Anna, the construction of the power station, well, I should say the construction of, of Lake Anna and the power station started in the late 60s. Mm-hmm. Um, can you just walk us through kind of how how the lake itself was made, how how the river was dammed up, uh, and then after that we can talk about how the the nuclear part, the reactor, uh, was made. Sure, of course they had the, the Dominion at the time was called uh, Virginia uh, Electric and Power Company at the Vepco. time. Vepco. Vepco. They had to acquire the land that was needed. There was lots of engineering studies of how big of a lake we needed and uh, what depth we needed at the location of the of the plant. Mm-hmm. And then uh, they had to purchase the land from all the landowners. Had to get the uh, you know all the regulatory issues there uh, with that. And then they cleared the bottom of the lake. All of the um, brush, trees, that type of thing, Mm -hmm. so that when they would start to fill the lake, the bottom would be, um, would be free of, of debris. A bunch of trees and things like that. How much digging had to actually occur versus how much of it, how much of it is, how much of the lake bed that's there now were, were just natural contours that were existing before? Almost all of it's natural. Wow. I always imagined that every square foot of that was dug out by a bulldozer or something. Uh, just basically they cleared the top soil off of it and cleared okay. any debris such as trees or brush and that type of thing. The rest of it is primarily uh, just the, the normal bed line. Uh, if you go to the river beds or the creek beds, mm-hmm. that's where the deepest portions are. Until you get down to the dam facility, there was some digging out down there. And then was there also some digging done near the dikes to, to help make those? And we'll get into that in just a minute. But Yeah, we actually had to dig the canals that connect 
the different sections of the waste okay. heat treatment facility. To clarify, though, you were not, I guess you were probably still in school at that time, right? Um, in the late 60s, early 70s? I was born in the mid 60s. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. So you were still a young pup when all I was, was playing with Tonka toys when they were building this place. Okay. Okay. So then I guess by high school, when you were in high school, then the lake was already around. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. The, the, um, the lake was filled very quickly. It was estimated to take years to fill and actually filled in about eight and a half months uh, due to those remnants of those uh, hurricanes that came through Virginia. Okay. And um, from there, uh, the lake was in its place and we just had to finish building the power plant itself. Let's take uh, a look just for uh, for anybody that's actually watching the show. I think most people are probably listening, but if you look at picture one, what are we looking at here? That's just a picture of the uh, power plant as it exists today. Uh, if you see uh, the two round objects, mm -hmm. uh, those, those domes, those domes are the unit one, which is closest to you in the picture, and unit two, which is further away. And inside those domes is where all of the primary plant components are, the reactor pressure vessel, the steam generators, the uh, reactor coolant pumps, and all the piping where all the nuclear reactions and everything takes place is inside that dome. And Interesting. So are we, just perspective here, are we looking at it from the waste heat treatment side, or are we looking at this from the public side, the yeah, main lake side? Actually, um, the water body right in front of you is mm -hmm. our discharge canal. Oh, okay. The water comes out and runs down that discharge canal to the left of the picture, entering the waste heat treatment facility. Okay, so this is what you're seeing here is the beginning of the private side, the that's, discharge canal. That's correct. And this part of the that discharge canal is only available to Dominion. That's Dominion property there. So no I one got, can drive their boat up in there. Oh, right. So this is on the other side for anybody that's been there. They're familiar with the the orange buoys and do yes. not cross this line or you'll be shot quickly. That whole. Well, I don't know about the shot quickly, but, right. but uh, you, you can't cross it. Yeah. <laughs> you can't cross it. You can't. <laughs> Security up there is pretty tight and I'm, and I'm glad it's tight for obvious reasons. But um, no, that spot is, uh, as you, I, I'm sure you're very aware, of, that that's a favorite spot to, you know, anchor a boat just mm -hmm. outside of that. You know, I've been doing that since I was very, very young, go up there at night, anchor a boat. And um, you'll quickly learn also if you jump in the water there, and you're not somehow tethered to the boat mm. and your boat is anchored, you know, in two minutes, you're going to be a hundred yards away. The flow right there is amazing. Yeah. When both units are at a hundred percent power and all of the circulating water pumps are running, that's 2 million gallons of water per minute flowing down. Through wow. There. Wow. Well, you can feel it. I mean, and then if you're trying to swim back to your boat, it's like swimming upstream. I mean, it's amazing. My kids will just yell at me now, come get us. Mm. So you can pull the anchor up, yeah. and go pick them up. Uh, but that's interesting. Okay, it, so the, go ahead. If it's okay, I'll finish the Please, picture. please. The green buildings that are behind the two domes, mm -hmm. that is the balance of plant equipment. That is where all of the uh, steam production equipment is. That's where the steam turns the turbines, mm -hmm. which turns the electrical generator, which makes the electricity. And then on the opposite side of that green building is the main transformers that transport that power through uh, power lines up to our switch yard and then goes out to the to the electrical grid. Now, when you say big green buildings, you're talking about the rectangular building behind yes. the domes there? Okay. N yes, yes. The and long building. The longest building, yes. Okay. Longest, tallest building. Fascinating. Fascinating. So I imagine this, this discharge, this canal here was probably dug a bit. Yes. How deep is that, the canal? Uh, it's... I don't know the exact depth. Uh, it's on a neighbor of about 30 feet. Okay. Neighborhood okay. of 30 feet. So interesting. Okay. And then if we're, if we just look at the next uh, mm -hmm. picture, the one that's labeled too, this is the map yep. of Lake Anna. And again, just for, for anyone that's what's watching, you said that the lake is about so what, 17 miles long. Uh, yes. Ish. About 17 miles long, about a mile and a half at its wide, its width. And that's down at, toward the bottom, I yes, guess, on the, on the main lake where it says Lake Anna. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can just, yeah, just go ahead and, and, and walk our guests through this, uh, sure. this image here. There are a couple of numbers on the picture here. Mm -hmm. uh, number four is where the main dam is. And 
from there, okay. we're required to release a certain volume of flow into the North Anna River because it then supports uh, other uh, towns and cities and counties downstream mm-hmm. of us for water. Uh, but that's where the dam is. And you'll see as you proceed up to the um, to the left and to mm-hmm. the uh, up in that direction, you see that's a lighter colored blue in the picture. That is the public side of the lake or the main lake. So right where it says the words Lake Anna. Yes, and all the way up to way up into the like Orange and Spotsylvania County, mm-hmm. up into the uh, that's all part of the public side of the lake. Okay. And then if okay. you notice, um, uh, number two is the North Anna Power Station. So we take the water out of the main part of the lake, we use it in our facilities, and then you see the, a very skinny canal that connects into the first part of the waste heat treatment facility which Mm -hmm. is the dark blue Mm -hmm. and that canal is the canal we saw in the first picture okay okay right the little the little blue stripe directly below the number two that's correct that's what we were just looking at that's correct so so what close to where the number two is Mm -hmm. and i want to we're going to dive in a little more detail in a minute but that's where the water comes in Mm-hmm. And then it it comes out where the number three is, and that's, that's where the that's where the water that's the water cools. And then way up top, there's a number one. Mm-hmm. That's just the beginning of what we call the lake. Anything above that would be either the creeks or rivers that support it. Is the number one where the North Anna River taps into the lake? That's not where it comes in, but yeah, it it. Uh, I'm not sure. Let me follow up on that. I don't know that answer. It's okay. All right. Well, I can't read on this. I can't read on this whether that's North Anna River or not. But up at that end of the lake, yes, that's where the that, that's it's it, one of those fingers there. And yeah, I'm yes. sorry this, if this didn't print as clear, but one of those fingers is where the North Anna plugs in. That's right. And earlier you said the North Anna is that's that's what was plugged up, so to speak, to make the lake. Correct. And the plug was the dam that's down right. at number four. That's correct. Basically, a, a big wall was was erected. Yep. Um, a minute ago, I just want to go back to kind of you know construction. Um, you, you mentioned that it was VEPCO at the time mm-hmm. became Dominion Energy later as VEPCO. They went about and obtaining all of this land. Was this just, this was just farmland before, right? Yeah. Primarily farmland and some wooded land. And again, I understand that you weren't involved at that time, but you might have some kind of hearsay knowledge on this here, but how did VEPCO go about acquiring the land from the farmers? Uh, they made offers to buy, okay, and um, the offers were uh, much higher than the current real estate values at the time. Okay, and most people accepted that. Most, most. Uh, there were a few that they had to negotiate with. Uh, there was no land taken by eminent domain that I'm aware really of, that I'm aware of. Right. Wow. So Interesting. They just eventually settled with the landowners for what they felt was a fair price. So the smart farmers held out and held out and held out and maybe, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if they're extracted were, a higher, right, right, right. Yeah, I don't know that part, but that's fascinating. Okay. So as far as you know, no imminent domain was exercised. It was all voluntary, just different, different prices. That's correct. Have you ever heard about what the acreage prices were? No, I, I don't know, but I, I know that, you know, land away from here at the time was, you know, really cheap. I bet, I bet. You know, maybe a hundred or a few dollars an acre, right? Which is uh, you could not buy that land today for that. No, 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 no. Yeah, I, I've heard, I've heard uh, people talk about fifty dollars an acre for yeah. for some of this. Yeah. Um, interesting. Yeah, my uh, my father shortly after the lake was made, he was in medical school. Um, I think he was in medical school at the time, and at, at MCV in Richmond, and uh, and saw an ad in the paper where they were selling, you know, waterfront property. And, and he came out and, and walked uh, the land, you know, miles and miles of the land with his real estate agent at the time on the private side mm-hmm. and ended up buying, you know, you know, r- roughly three acres. I think he and a friend went in on six acres of waterfront, but e- each waterfront acre was, you know, I think $5,000 or $7,000 at the time. And obviously it's a little more expensive than that. Probably had a couple additional zeros now. To, yeah. To yeah. That. Yeah, those yeah those lots the waterfront lots are going for you know, half a million plus now as you know as you know yeah but um, yeah he he told some folks in his family after he made the purchase and he was mocked for wasting his money so but I guess hindsight's always twenty twenty right yeah um 
I want to talk about lake levels. I know that there's there's some kind of pretty serious I- intention behind holding the surface level of the lake at a certain sea level. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the it's 250 feet above sea level on the main lake, mm-hmm. and roughly a foot to 18 inches higher on on, on the on the um, for the cooling um, side, the private side. It it really depends on how many of our circulating water pumps are operating at right. the time. We were just talking about this, right? Yeah. Uh, in the winter period of time, we do not need to run all of our circulating water pumps um, because of the colder water temperature of the main lake. So mm-hmm. at when, when we turn one of those off for each unit for basically um, December to April time frame, the waste heat treatment facility or the, the warm side or the dark portion in our picture right, there right. would drop about eight and a half inches okay. just because um, of the delta across the plant there. And that's why right now um, the the private side, I live on the private side, and the water level appears to be uh, a, f- a foot or two down. So right now one of the pumps is off? Yes, one per unit. Okay. And when you say per unit, that's per reactor? Yes, we have two units. So there are two reactors, two units, and then there are, did you, uh, forgive me if you just said this, there are three pumps in each unit? There are four circulating water pumps for each unit. For each we unit. turn one off in the winter okay. operations. Okay. And that's because the, you just don't need it that's as correct. much. Can you peel one layer off of that? Why Why don't you need it? I think you referenced because the water temperature is lower. Yes. Okay, yes. and, but why does that mean you don't? We use the water from the lake, and it goes through what we call a condenser. Mm-hmm. That condenser is just a big heat exchanger. Okay. So if your water is already colder when mm-hmm. it goes in, it can remove the heat much more efficiently. You don't need as much flow to get the cooling that you need for your plant. Okay. So. Okay. Interesting. So one pump is off in each unit, wintertime we'll call it. And that causes the the level on the warm side to drop. That's correct. Um, why why does the temp the discharge temperature drop, or does it? I feel like sometimes I'll look at you know the discharge temperature in the winter time, and it's seventy five degrees, eighty degrees. But then in the summertime, discharge temperature sometimes will be ninety nine. It obviously doesn't stay there, but that all depends on the weather and and the really? atmospheric conditions, right? Because okay. The majority of the heat removed out of the waste heat treatment facility is by either evaporation or mm-hmm. just uh, conduction. Okay. So if the air temperature is colder, you get a much better heat transfer to the atmosphere. Okay. And the and the temperatures will be lower. Um, and then of course, if you add precipitation such as snow or ice, that type of thing mm-hmm. affects it also. So, uh, but if in the summer you're not getting very much cooling. Matter of fact, if it's a really hot summer day with mm-hmm. the bright sun, mm-hmm. you're, you're, you don't get any significant uh, heat reduction initially coming out of the plant. Coming out right. It has to get down to dike two, dike three. Mm-hmm. By the time it's over there, it'll, it cools a little. Um, why? And again, I, I appreciate that you weren't involved at the very, very beginning, but is there a reason why they picked 250? As opposed to 200 or 300. I've heard some people talk about a relationship to the 100-year floodplain, um, and they wanted to make sure that it was above that, but I've never... Uh, I'm not sure if the floodplain figures into it or not. It may, Mm -hmm. but 250 was the elevation that was used to design the plant. Okay. Because your pumps have to lift the water from the lake and pump the water through your condenser. Okay. So you have to know how much what's called pump head, how much ability the pump can lift the water that far and flow it at, okay. you know, basically a million gallons a minute per unit. Wow. So um, all of that was engineered into it. So the 250 foot above mean sea level was a design feature of the plant. Okay. I don't know if it was related to the um, uh, floodplain or not. Sure, sure. Okay. And then... W- I'm sure there is a reason. What is the reason that the the discharge side, the, the warm side, is typically kept a little higher, unless one of the pumps is off, as you just described? It's just the, it's just the pumps doing work. 
Okay, that's, that's just how, how it's it just how they're working. And, and when the pumps, they actually the pumps actually lower the part of the lake slightly because it's sucking two million gallons of water a minute wow. out of the lake. Wow, it's so strong. Okay, so if you said it already, when do do you anticipate, or when typically does it happen that that fourth pump? in each unit gets turned back on. Yeah, it, it depends on the uh, weather conditions, mm-hmm. but typically in early to mid-April okay. would be the right time. We'll start the fourth pump again. Uh, that will run until the winter unless there is a maintenance outage, a refueling outage that would be in the fall, and then one of those pumps would be turned off okay. during that 30-day period approximately for the maintenance outages. But when, just terminology... When mm-hmm. pumps are off, mm-hmm. that does not mean reactors are off. In this case, we have to have circulating water pumps operating if our reactor is operating. Okay. We, we have to have an ultimate place to put the heat that's generated. Okay. Um, we can have the circulating pumps running and the reactor off, and that happens periodically. Okay. But okay. Uh, it cannot go the other way. Okay. That's so, so interesting. Yeah, there there are certain rules on the the waste heat treatment facility. There, there's not allowed any commerce. Right. So you right can't have a marina there. You can't. So to clarify for for folks at home, yeah, there is no commercial activity, and this is as a I'm also a real estate agent. As a real estate agent, the conversation you know I, I have with many clients. There's one of the key differences between the main lake and the private side is is no commerce is allowed, no commercial activity on the private side. Um. And I often get the question, why? So I, I certainly understand the temperature differential, and we'll get into that a little more. But but how does, if it does, how does commercial activity play a difference on the sides? Basically, the private side of the lake is a state water. Uh, so it's free to be used by anybody at any time. The public side or the private public, side? Public, public side. side. Public side. Public side. The private side or the waste heat treatment facility is totally Dominion property all the time. And if there would ever be a need, if there was ever some uh, issue with the plant, then Mm -hmm. we could control access to that whole part of the waste heat treatment facility. So the main lake is not considered Dominion property? It it is Dominion property, but it's a a public access access to – it's actually a public – lake in virginia mm-hmm. system and there's a state park there yeah, there is a the state park state there park. that is correct but on the private side yeah i understand that's exclusively owned and controlled but question remains why not allow commercial activity there well if, if you know if there was some that well first of all it was the original part of the agreement uh that was when they b- built the uh, facility okay the second Part of that is if there would be some hiccup at the plant, then we're we're wrecking someone's business if oh, there's a business there. That makes sense. So uh, uh, that was part of it all along is that the waste heat treatment facility would have no commerce. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, let's talk about something that we've you've addressed already is how the actual plant operates. Mm-hmm. And forgive me, but before we move along there, you had provided some really interesting photographs from the construction and some of the uh, the construction period. And I know some of the Lake Anna diehards, uh, myself included, would appreciate looking at this. So if we're looking at photo number three mm-hmm. here, what are we looking at here? That is actually the uh, containment dome being built. Wow. And is that one of the two big domes yes. that we saw? Okay. Is this... Is there a way to tell? Is this the one closer to uh, the, the discharge, or can you tell here? Uh, this should be the one closest to the discharge based on the picture. Interesting. Interesting. Now, that containment dome is very robust. I've heard. It's uh, four and a half feet thick of reinforced concrete. Okay. Uh, you can see the rebar that they're placing in the picture. The rebar is two inches in diameter mm-hmm. and multiple layers of it. Uh, there are places where you can barely see daylight through the rebar. Why? Wow, because it's so close. And then wow. they poured the uh, concrete, uh, very high tensile stress uh, concrete. Um, it's 
it's what we call missile protected. Now, not missiles like the military missiles, mm-hmm. but missiles such that anything that could be picked up and thrown into it by, say, a tornado or earthquake, uh, earthquake or anything of that nature. Um, right. So telephone poles, cars, uh, missile any of like that a stuff, flying object. That's of, right. Of that's right. Wow. And it can withstand all of that with no issue. Wow. And it's four and a half feet thick of concrete. Mm-hmm. Wow. Now, there's rumors floating around out there that sometimes you've been known to get up on top and rappel down for no. just for fun activity at night. No, no night rappelling off no, of the uh, no, containment no, facilities? No, no rappelling off right. of the containment right. facilities. And these are just construction workers, I yes, guess? Yes, these are here. construction workers. Uh, Scott told me that one of these guys is you. Nope. Is nope. That, that's not you? Nope. Got to remember, these right. came online in That's 78 right. and 80. You were, you were playing with Tonka trucks. I'm still playing with Tonka trucks when they were <laughs> right. pouring this concrete. <laughs> What's in, uh, so picture four, this Pic- is the dam picture being built? Picture four is a picture of the dam being built, as you can see. Um, if you turn the picture uh, slightly, you can actually see these are the uh, locations for the radial gates where the water would be let go if we have a major flooding or something of that nature where we need to discharge more water to maintain the elevation. So the radial gates are those those vertical the, kind of poles in, uh, in the dam? The radial gates would be in the rectangular sections there. there okay, three those dark black. Yes, right. that's correct. Interesting. So are they basically, for lack of a better term, are they just doors that yes. kind of open a little bit? And- well, they, they pull up. They go up. Yep, okay. and they're they're about uh, eight feet wide uh, there. So we can interesting. We we have actually had all of those open before wow. during a After major a lot flood, of rain or ma- major flood, and uh, that's um, millions of gallons of water a minute going through there. I wow. don't know how much. So if you, how close can you get to the opposite side of this? If I went out there and started driving around, can, is there a place where I can actually? See see the opposite side or you can't get no, that close no we we maintain access around the dam okay in the spillway that it that's dominion property that's um you would need a reason to go there if i was a dominion employee and i had a reason for being there and i'm on the back side and i'm mm-hmm. looking at it h- how far out of the water is the is the uh you know the the apparatus that i'm seeing on um, the other side because like uh, on, on the lake side you know you mm-hmm. can get your boat kind of up close to it and it's mm-hmm. it's big mm-hmm is it the same on the other side? Or oh, it goes all the way down to the North Anna River. So it's probably at least 50 or 60 feet down oh, wow. on the backside. Before you can, before it hits the river. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Fascinating. Yep. Fascinating. Um, and then, I, I, is this the, be, is, was this photo taken, assumedly here, it looks like there's water starting. Is this just the, the beginnings of the North yeah. Anna River starting to it, do its thing? It could be that, or it could be rainwater or something okay. that's just accumulated in it. Okay. And uh, the, the area now out in front of the dam is that's the deepest, one of the deepest parts of the lake, right? Probably approaching 100 feet in depth. Uh, I'd say about 80 feet. Wow. You ever gone scuba diving down there? I have not, but we have folks that do that periodically to do inspections. And wow. They, they, they go there on a periodicity up and uh, they take photos of the dam and everything so that we can do assessments of it and they also take pictures of fish and things while they're there. I've heard some people say that there are fish that are very big down there. We we put uh, carp in the lake many years ago to uh-huh. help with the grasses in the lake. Okay. And uh, some of the carp are very, very large. Still down there? The, a few years ago, one took a picture of one about six feet in length. Wow. A picture. It was a carp. But uh, wow. I, I've never seen them, but that's... Uh, do you fish at the lake? I, I used to fish at the lake uh, with my father, but I haven't fished in a long time there. Now, wow. so. I, I used to fish there with my father as well. Yeah. Good memories. Yeah. If we look at photo number five, what are we, what are we looking at here? Uh, photo number five, just to the left, is the original North Anna River bed. Okay. And it comes together with this other tributary to the, to the um, center of the picture, and that is the rest of that will be the lake that's the area that was cleared so that we could fill the, and make the lake so this is this is an area up toward the northern end of the yes, lake that we're it, looking at it, here it's up in Public the area side. of on 522 mm-hmm. up near uh the restaurant tim's yep up there yep awesome awesome and yeah it doesn't look it, it definitely looks cleared but it does not look like they dug it incredibly deep no they just removed the, what they needed to remove wow 
That's amazing. All right. Let's, uh, let's shift into, I, I'd love to hear some about, um, l- lake operations and you, you start like the power plant, h- how it works mm-hmm. and how it incorporates the lake. And, um, for reference in, in a minute, you know, we can look at number six, but just generally speaking again, you know, you, you started to address kind of how the circulation mm-hmm. works, but can you just explain it? Sure. Uh, both the North Anna units are Westinghouse pressurized water reactors, approximately 1,000 megawatts electric each. And they both operate, they're almost identical. Um, and if, if you see the photo uh, number six there, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. what's inside that, that uh, black, almost a box like, that it represents the containment domes that okay. we see. So the components that are inside there are the reactor, okay. the steam generators, and then the reactor coolant pumps to pump the water through there. So there's a, a loop of water that stays always inside the um, containment. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then if you see outside, there is a, a pump that's blue right now. Mm-hmm. And that's feed water that comes in and turns into steam and then goes back and turns the turbines, which turns the generator to make the power. So that's a second loop of water. Those two do not talk, they don't interact with each other. As you can see, the red water goes on the inside of the steam generators, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. tubes, and the blue water is on the outside, or what's called the shell side of the Is steam the blue generators. water the lake water? No. Okay, it, it's no, not. We haven't gotten to the lake water yet. Okay. So there's there's two different loops there, mm-hmm. and then you see the condenser mm-hmm. over on the right there. That green represents mm-hmm. the lake water. Oh, so interesting. So it would come in and go through uh, the tubes of the condenser and then come back out and go to the discharge canal. Fascinating. So, so none of the three loops interact with each other. Okay, so does lake water... It, it, on this picture, lake water never goes into the reactor. That's correct. Interesting. Okay, and I think that's a, a point worth emphasizing here for everybody listening and reading. And that's that's a question, a common question I get, yep. you know, as as a real estate agent here is, you know, where how how exactly is the is the lake water interacting with the nuclear stuff, the hot stuff, yep. and and so you're saying. Yeah, it doesn't even it doesn't even go near it. No, it doesn't. Fascinating. Matter of fact, if you had some other type of power plant here that mm-hmm. either burn natural gas or coal or oil or whatever, everything that's outside of the containment building would be the exact same. Okay. And then okay. what's different is how we're generating the steam, which is inside the containment building. So the water that generates the steam, that's not lake water nope. either. Nope. Interesting. It, it started as lake water, but we cleaned it and processed it and oh, made it. Okay, that's where so, it came from initially. That's right, but it's a closed system. And, okay, you know, so the two don't, don't right. mix. That's correct. And again, kind of referencing here the, the picture, what role in, in this diagram does the lake water play? It comes in, again, at the green, on the right-hand side of the green, and it comes into the condenser. Right. Is the condenser... Does that have a bunch of heat that it's putting into? So, it, so basically, it's somewhere for the heat to go. That's right. The steam, when it spends its, it uses its energy to spin the turbine. It's exhausted down. Okay. It's still hot water. So, so it turns into steam and then it condenses back into water. Yep. And the way we do that is by using the lake water through the tube side of the condenser. The, okay. the steam is on the shell side, and it okay. condenses back to water, and it's then pumped back to the steam generators to become steam again. Okay, and that's the blue line. That's the blue line. It's coming back over mm-hmm. out of the reactor. Okay, okay. And then and, you know why, forgive me if this is a stupid question, but why, why in a plant like this do you need a lake? Why can't you just emit that hot air or hot steam out into the sky, you know, like a, a steam stack or something. Well, you could you could have a, a cooling tower or something like that. Okay. Whether it's mechanical cooling or evaporative cooling with water, you could do that. Many nuclear power plants have uh, cooling towers, uh, but many are on rivers or lakes or even the, uh, the ocean, mm-hmm. and they, they just use the water flow to remove the heat, Okay. Versus, uh, which is what we do. 
Interesting. So that that green band there is where the water gets warm, mm-hmm. and then it and then it's discharged on the on the left side there. That's correct. Fascinating. A couple of questions about the reactor itself. Um, and I know you you did years of school to understand the answer to the question that I'm, I'm about to ask. But how how is the reactor creating heat, creating energy over there? What's if there's a kind of a simple answer for that? I'll try to not get too uh, engineering on you here. Okay, um, and I'll probably interrupt you with with a couple questions to okay. clarify. Uh, inside the reactor are 157 fuel assemblies. Each fuel assembly has fuel rods that have individual fuel pellets in them. What's a fuel rod look like? How it's, long is uh, it? It's 13 feet long okay. and about uh, five-eighths of an inch in diameter. Wow, so it's long and skinny. Correct. And how many of those are sitting in, in a given reactor, one of the units over there? Well, each fuel assembly is in what we call a 17 by 17 array, so 17 by 17 feet. F- no, number of rods. Oh, number of rods, okay. 17 by 17. That's one fuel assembly, 13 wow. feet long. Okay. And then there are 157 of those fuel assemblies inside the reactor. So there's thousands of those rods oh, yes. that are 13 feet long yes. over there. And every refueling outage, which is every 18 months, we replace one-third of those and put wow. new fuel in. And the fuel is uh, uranium-enriched. Uh, okay. That's what allows the neutrons to start the fission reaction and when the when the neutron is absorbed, uh, the uranium fissions and some other products fission, and that generates the heat. That's where the heat comes from. How, where do these nuclear rods? If I'm, forgive me if I'm butchering the term, but where do they come from? Uh, they're they're fabricated by different vendors. Uh, we primarily use Westinghouse, which is the original equipment manufacturer for our plant. Where are they located? Columbia, South Carolina. How, how does it get here from South Carolina? Uh, trucks. Wow. So the, these trucks rolling down the freeway with nuclear rods. But they're not not—they're not radioactive. Of course. Uh, they're not radioactive <laughs> until you not. put them into a, a nuclear flux. The neutrons have to hit them to start the reactions. Okay. I and mean, that was going to be my next question. Uh, obviously, they're not reactive. Mm-hmm. W- w- what's the trigger? What, what makes them reactive? Any neutron em- uh, embarment to the fuel rods. Okay, and is that once they're put in the system, is there is there a button that's pushed to kind of no, make no. that happen? No, it's occurring naturally. It occurs naturally. That's correct. Okay, so you have to, I imagine you put them in close proximity with something else that starts the reaction. Yeah, typically a, a, a third of the core is replaced every refueling, and they're not all in one spot. They're mm-hmm. spread out across the the footprint of the reactor, mm-hmm. and that and the two thirds of the fuel that is existing is still emitting neutrons. So that's what starts the reaction. Wow, that's interesting. So that's creating the heat. Yes, and when the fissions occur, heat is uh, given off, and that's what makes turns the water to steam. And then the steam turns a turbine. Mm-hmm. Is the turbine in the reactor? No, no, over no. at the facility. No, the turbine, the turbines are in that green building that we saw oh, in the first okay. picture. Okay. And how many turbines are there? Uh, there are actually three per unit. Okay, so six total. Is that right? Six total. Um, h- how big are they? What do they look like? There, are, there's a high pressure turbine that's relatively small, maybe the size of this desk, a table. Okay. Uh, and then the the low pressure turbines are bigger. They have longer blades because the pressure of the steam is lower by the time it gets to that stage. Okay. Um, they're on the order of a tractor trailer size. Okay. And the steam gets them spinning pretty fast. They spin at eighteen hundred revolutions per minute. Okay. And that's translating into the energy. Yes, and that's what uh, that with the the design of our generator gives us sixty cycles per second, which is normal in the United States for okay. power. Wow! And this is spitting out power. At layman's terms, I mean, how, I mean, how many? I've, I've heard you know fifteen to twenty percent of the power in Virginia is is coming out of this this play out of naps. Yes, that's wow. correct. About seventeen percent right now. My goodness! <clears throat> and that's used commercially, residentially, Everywhere. all the above. Yeah. 
all yeah, the above. It goes into a, a system and it can wherever it needs to flow, it flows. I think it's terribly ironic that the that the residential power here at the lake is Rappahannock. <laughs> Well, we, we we buy our power for them too. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting. So interesting. Um, okay. So, Stuart, just to kind of wrap up our discussion about the operation, and I'm sure we'll get into a little bit more. But so, it, just to be clear for all of the listeners and all the viewers out there, the lake water does not in any way, shape, or form react with the reactor, the reactor area. They're two completely distinct components. Never the two shall meet. They don't overlap, et cetera. That is all correct. And I thought, I don't remember who told me this, but I remember being someone with knowledge that there's a certain, like you, you could not use the lake water to, to accomplish what needs to be accomplished because of the, the salinity or the type of the water. or the, the water used in the reactor coolant system, which is the stuff inside the mm-hmm. uh, containment building, is what I call ultra pure. It mm-hmm. has absolutely no impurities in it, no metals, no anything. And that's done because the, when that water goes through the reactor vessel, mm-hmm. if it has any of those com- components in it, those would become activated and become radioactive. So oh, wow. the water is so pure, you, you cannot drink it. Wow. So. Wow. But bottom line, the, the lake water is completely separate and distinct from what's going on at the power plant. That's correct. The water never goes over there, and that's good. And and that's a common question, you know, I, I, I get as a, as a real estate agent, um, and I make the stupid joke about me swimming in the water, and my skin glows for 10 or 15 minutes, and then after they give me a courtesy laugh, um, you know, I try to explain the same. So I'm, I'm glad you've uh, you've made that clear. I, I'd, I'd like to talk about... Uh, next, and I think this is kind of your wheelhouse, safety. You're the director of safety and licensing. H- how is safety maintained over or at the plant? And I, and I think there are two things that, that you could address. Safety at the plant itself, and then safety in terms of the discharge. Mm-hmm. And we've, we've talked about the discharge quite extensively already. That, that water, the lake water, has never gone anywhere close to the nuclear reactor, but yeah. When we talk safety, we talk multiple as, uh, aspects of safety. We talk about nuclear safety, which is uh, main, maintaining the, the uh, plant in a safe condition such that we protect the plant, we protect the people that work there, and we p- protect the public. Mm-hmm. So nuclear safety is, is a requirement to operate a nuclear power plant in the United States. Um, that's where the regulations come from, from agencies such as the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and, and maintain and, and verify that we're operating in that. So nuclear safety is the highest level of safety. We also talk about industrial safety. No one gets hurt. Uh, our mm-hmm. goal is that no one gets hurt working in our plant. Sure. Um, and then we talk about environmental safety. Environmental okay. safety is that we're good environmental stewards. We do not... Uh, discharge any kind of petroleum products or anything like that into the lake we don't uh, uh, have any air pollution we don't do anything that would uh, worsen the environment around our facility and then radiological safety radiological safety is basically the safety of the workers in the plant and Mm -hmm. the public if there's ever an emergency or some hiccup with operations then we uh, take that very seriously and make sure that um, we we protect the public in all aspects of that. Are there plant workers that go into the reactors, get close to the reactors? Oh yes. Is that okay? And yes. is that is that an environment where it's 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 quote safe enough where you're dressed like this, or do they have special clothing that they're wearing um, to protect themselves? When when the reactor is operating, there's some places inside containment that we cannot go just because the radiation exposure would be too high to spend long, long, large amounts of time there. Mm-hmm. However, when it's shut down for refueling, the whole containment is available, and we do maintenance during that. Mm-hmm. And we typically wear what's called anti-contamination clothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you think of um, 
getting dust on you or something of that nature. If you mm-hmm. were sanding and you made dust, you know how it can go everywhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you're working and you're opening up any of this equipment that could potentially be contaminated inside, we would wear kind of that Tyvek type coverall type thing mm-hmm. and then take them off when we come out to make sure we don't spread any contamination outside the area. Um, there's no other... Uh, respiratory protection or anything of that nature that we would wear for normal maintenance activities. So interesting. Interesting. Um, the North Anna power station website mentions, and this is related a continuous environmental monitoring program. Mm -hmm. Could you just briefly explain what that means and, and how that works? Well, we have, we have lots of things that we monitor. We monitor our discharges for any kind of chemical uh, upsets, pH, temperature, um, any contaminants that could potentially get into the, that. We monitor our, any kind of discharge uh, related to uh, running any of our like diesel generators or anything of that nature mm-hmm. from an environmental standpoint, from air pollution. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and then during, uh, if there would be an emergency event, then we would do even more monitoring, both radiological monitoring. Uh, we have on-site weather <laughs> equipment that okay. allows us to determine wind speed, wind direction, temperatures, the stability of the atmosphere, and things of that nature. So okay. if we uh, would happen to have a release of radio radioactive uh, materials, then we can uh, assess that and, and make the appropriate uh, recommendations to the state of Virginia if we need to take any acti- actions. If you needed to. If we but obviously to. that has never We happened. have not had to do that <laughs> yet. <laughs> so um, talking about, you know, again, kind of safety, you know, 2011. Mm-hmm. You, were you there in 2011? I was there. 2011 is was the earthquake year. It was, August 23rd. Wow. And and uh, it, it, to me, I mean, it sounds like this is a shining star of how the system worked and it worked correctly. But um, for anyone that doesn't remember, uh, in 2011, there was a very serious earthquake. An earthquake, uh, the epicenter was not far from the power plant, miles down the road. Mm-hmm. And I... I was in South Carolina at the time, and I felt it, and I clearly felt it. My my brother is a lawyer in D.C. He felt it. People in New York felt it. Mm-hmm. So did I hear correctly that the power plant has – this was just a you know hearsay, rumor, or her, but um, it, it can sense seismic, you know, as it starts or before it begins. Yeah, we, we have seismic monitoring equipment at the plant. Okay. Um, we have, um, we even have more now than we had then. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we have seismic monitoring equipment, and what actually caused us to shut down were some uh, protective relays on our uh, transformers that provide the power to the plant. Mm-hmm. And when they were shaken by the earthquake, uh, they opened up and. We uh, trip both our units, shut both our units down automatically. So the so they were programmed to mm-hmm. to do that in this case, and they shut down. Yep. And so so the reactor shut down. Mm-hmm. And why is it important to shut down a reactor if there's an earthquake? That's the safest place uh, to be, because then all you have to do is to maintain the reactors in a cold condition, a cool mm-hmm. condition, and that's less of a requirement for equipment, and it's a less requirement to maintain them there for long periods of time. Our plant is built such that uh, anything the world could go away outside of the plant, mm-hmm. and we can stay in a safe condition for 30 days without any additional uh, resources needed. Uh, totally self-contained. S- correct. Wow. So uh, the safest condition is shut down so that you're only removing what's called decay heat that time okay so as the earthquake started the reactor shut down as they were supposed to and and then what happened basically nothing happened for (laughs) a period of time we uh we initially we declared a site uh, excuse me a alert Mm -hmm. which is the second of the lowest categories for the uh 
classification. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started doing inspections and testing and started the analysis of the event. What did it mean to the plant, the earthquake? What uh, We had very little damage at the plant. We brought in uh, numerous inspectors. We brought in the NRC. Uh, we brought in the NRC media, is the, the Nuclear yeah. Regulatory Commission. Okay, the federal agency yep. who regulates this. That's correct. So we, you invited them in. The yep. media came in. Yep. We brought the media in. If you Google me, you'll find my five seconds of fame in the uh, New York uh, Excellent. Times. Excellent. Uh, some pictures of going in containment with them. Wow. Um, so... Uh, uh, but, yeah, we went through a very exhaustive, detailed process, both analytically to prove that the plants were safe, and then we inspected all of the plants. And when I say all, I mean every piece of pipe, every mm -hmm. pump, every fan, every everything was inspected for damage. We did uh, t we tested them, we ran them, checked for vibrations, we checked for uh, any contaminants in the oil, which could be a potentially show you some any hidden damage that occurred during the earthquake, but you can't see. Oh, interesting. Uh, so we had to do all of that, and then we had to convince the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that it was safe to start back up, and they gave us the permission to start back up on November 11th. So how long was the plant down for inspections? About 90 days. Okay. Wow. And then back up and, yep. and running. Yep. And has run, you know, safely since then. One of the last things I'd like to talk about, and it's, and, and I want to ask about this is because it's a, it's a common source of impact on the, the residents, employees, I imagine the whole lake, and that's the, the maintenance that's done. I understand that there's annual maintenance that's done. And then it, it, is there or can for what type of maintenance? Well, I'm I'm okay. I'm 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 here to ask you. Okay, uh, and I might be misunderstanding, okay. but it, it may be an outage. You okay. know, and and I'm I'm I think I'm you know okay. I might be conflating two terms, okay. but there's annual outages. Um, I hear sometimes about maintenance that goes on. Can you just kind of speak to that? Sure. How it affects water levels. And sure. We we have a large um, industrial facility, so we're doing maintenance all the time, whether okay. it's preventative or whether it's corrective if something breaks, okay. um, that type of thing. So we, we're doing maintenance, maintenance all the time. Once every 18 months on each unit, then we shut the units down for approximately 30 days to refuel and do maintenance that we can't do when, it, when, when it's, it's operating. On. So once every 18 months. That's correct. So with two units, you know, one year will be a single unit, either fall or spring. The following year will be both fall and spring, the way, okay. the way it works. Okay. So, but, it, but there's always one going yes. when the other one's off. That's correct. Okay. And that's the quote outage mm -hmm. you hear about. How long does that last? Approximately 30 days. And it's called an outage because the reactor is turned off. That's correct. It's out. And what's happening during that 30 day period? Uh, we refuel the reactor with new fuel rods. We do. So what does that mean? You're, you're taking out the old we ones. Take, we take a third of the ones out, uh, 157 fuel assemblies, and we put a third new ones back in. Uh, we do maintenance on the turbines do maintenance on the generator we do maintenance on other systems that are supplying steam or or water constantly during mm -hmm. the when it's operating that you can't do any other time um it, it's a it's a it's a lot of activities go on uh, that's where we work a lot of hours we, we bring, bring in a lot of seasonal lot of employees yeah, about a thousand additional supplemental employees come in for that period of time and uh and we do that maintenance and then start the units back up. And and the goal is to run for 18 months until you have to shut them down again. Just to wrap up, um, let's talk a bit about recreation um, at the lake. You know, what type of recreation um, happens uh, at the lake? What's permitted? Um, Anything not permitted? Well, certainly, you know, uh, the lake is very popular for fishing. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there are like 33 species of fish in the Lake really? Anna stocked, uh, stripers and largemouth bass and catfish. Some of those are most popular. They have fishing tournaments and things on the, on the public side of the lake. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. 
uh, obviously boating, water skiing. Uh, you see folks out there with sailboats. Some um, you see folks. Uh, 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 I'm not sure what's the, uh, the, the like surfboard with the sail, uh, well, whatever that, that's called. Well, well, <laughs> I, when I was talking to Scott earlier this week, he said that you're actually one of the leading expert wake surfers out at Lake Anna right now. Is that true? You're a wake surfer. Um, you ride behind a Centurion 24 footer. I do not. You do not. I do not. <laughs> well, we can change whoever, that. Whoever, we can, whoever we can change told that. you that uh, is uh, stretching the truth slightly. Well, you're you're going to have to come back, and we're going to get you <laughs> get you behind the boat. So, but there's hunting and fishing yeah, and you there's know, fishing, everything. Here. Um, there's hunting around the lake, you know, but that's subject to whoever owns the property, right? Um, you see duck blinds around the lake. Yeah, and there's plenty of uh, plenty of game around. Mm -hmm. um, just at North Anna on our property, there's uh, lots of deer, uh, lots of turkey, uh, bear, uh, eagles, osprey. Uh, and then all of the normal smaller animals. And it sounds like you guys go out of your way to to protect, you know, the environment here. Yes. And it's pretty clear from someone who lives here that uh, the the wildlife and the environment is flourishing. I mean, there's always. I mean, the amount of bald eagles mm -hmm. that I see, American bald eagles, is just it's yeah. just amazing. Yeah, we have a couple that are resident on our property. Wow. So one of the most popular things here at the lake is the July Fourth fireworks show. Mm -hmm. Um. Do you all, other than allowing it to happen, do you guys play any role in that? Um, we have a, a person that actually works under me that's mm -hmm. called the Reservoir Coordinator. Okay. and That, that used to be Piriagi? It used to be. <laughs> yes, it did. And now it is? Uh, Devin uh, Payne. Devin Payne, because Piri Payne. recently left. Yes. We yeah, missed Piri. I'm he, sure Devin's doing a great job, but we yeah, missed Piri. He retired. Um but yes, uh, that that person is involved with it. Um, mm -hmm. It's a volunteer type effort to help with the fireworks and everything. But it's that, a great show. Yeah, that position, the Devin's position, is the person that works with homeowners for building boat houses, boat docks, dredging, mm -hmm. whatever you need to, and doing the permit portion of that to comply with the rules and regulations for and the lake for all the listeners out there you guys have a great website that lays out you know all of the guidelines for building boathouses and riprap and, and i'll say speaking from personal experience you all are very cooperative uh, and inviting in terms of building boathouses and building lakes as an agent i get a lot of questions are they going to let me do this and are going to let me do that and my answer is always this look as, as long as you stay within these guidelines I mean, they're going to approve your application to build a boathouse. I mean, you are wonderful in that regard. Yeah, you'd be surprised how many people don't want to stay within the rules. <laughs> that, that doesn't surprise me. That, that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, future of the lake. You know, we read and we hear about maybe there's going to be a third reactor. <clears throat> Can you address that? Sure. Um, we currently have a construction and operating permit for a third nuclear reactor at North Anna. We have not decided whether to build that at this time. Um, but you have the you've been given permission. We've we have permit from the federal government NRC okay. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We do not have permission from the uh, state corporation commission, which uh, controls our rate of profit and how much we charge for electricity and things okay. of that nature in Virginia. Okay. But um, at this time, uh, we're we're continuing to evaluate. That. That's a twenty year permit that we have. Okay. Um, there's also, uh, um, the new thing in the industry now are small modular reactors that are coming. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a possibility that something like that could end up here and other places in Virginia also. Is that on the website? I read about the GE simplified boiling water reactor. Yeah. Is that the smaller modular one you're talking about? No, that's, that's, the, that's the unit three permit that we got. Okay. That is a 1500 megawatt bo boiling water reactor. Okay. Made by GE Hitachi. Okay, okay, but you're undecided whether Correct. you're gonna do yeah, that. Yeah, it really not. depends on economics and and you know a bunch of other political factors. Interesting. Well, I, I appreciate your time very much. I don't want to keep you any longer. You've been very generous with your time. I want to thank you, and I want to thank Dominion Energy, and I want to thank um, your media liaison, Scott Miller, for being you guys have been very, very cooperative. Really appreciate your time, and I look forward to getting you behind a Centurion to do some wake surfing. We're going to see you out there. Uh, thank you very much. Stuart, thanks for being it. here. 
Hey guys, so that was a fantastic interview with Stuart Morris from Dominion Energy. A very interesting uh, interview. I learned a lot. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you learned some as well. Uh, as your guide here, just as your your tour guide, so to speak, uh, just wanted to tie up a few loose ends and add some additional information uh, to clarify some things that happened during the interview and to add some additional information that we didn't quite uh, have time to get to. Uh, but before we start, I do just want to extend my thanks to Dominion Energy and to Stuart and to Scott. Uh, for their time. Uh, they were very gracious um, with their time and uh, coming here and agreeing uh, to do the interview. It was a lot of fun, but I just wanted to say thank you very, very much for uh, for participating. Um, one point I wanted to really drive home because it's a question as a real estate agent I get a lot here at Lake Anna and from you know friends who don't live here is about the safety. Um, as Stuart mentioned and explained, the water that is from the lake, the lake water never gets anywhere close to or tangled with the nuclear reactors, the nuclear rods, all the nuclear stuff. They're kept completely separate. In fact, the water that is used uh, in the energy production process and generates the steam, it's not the lake water. It's that pure water that he was talking about, water that's so, so pure you can't even drink it. Two completely separate water sources. Um, the two don't ever touch one another. The two processes are totally separate. So that's what contributes to one of the main safety factors uh, here at the lake, just in terms of being in the water and, 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 uh, and, and the like. Um, another piece of information that we didn't get to, we started to address it, were the guidelines for boathouses. This is, as a real estate agent, this is something uh, I get into a lot with clients, clients asking, um, can we build a boathouse here? If we can, how big can it be, uh, et cetera? We didn't have time to address that, so let me just lay out some of this now. And by the way, this information is laid out very clearly on the Dominion's, the North Anna Power Station website. Uh, there's a four-page PDF document that outlines all of this very, very clearly. It's a great resource, so we'll include that in the show notes, but I want to include, encourage you to, to check that out. Um, but the, the boathouse guidelines are threefold. Uh, they address the uh, total square footage of the boathouse, how big can it be. Uh, they address the height uh, and they address the protrusion, how, how, how far out from the shoreline uh, your boathouse can be. Uh, and again, as I tried to emphasize when Stuart was here, as long as you fit within these guidelines and you don't block your neighbor's boathouse, Dominion's going to approve your request to build a boathouse. So the size of your boathouse, number one, is dictated specifically by the amount of shoreline that you have. If your shoreline is under 54 feet, you cannot have a pier or a boathouse under 54 feet. If you're between 55 and 99 feet, just add a zero to determine your square footage. So if I have a 60 foot amount of shoreline, 60 feet, then I can add a zero. I can have 600 square foot boathouse or pier. If my shoreline exceeds 100 feet, somewhere between 100 feet of shoreline and 300 feet of shoreline, then the maximum size of my boathouse is 2,000 square feet. And that's the footprint size, you know, looking at it from above. The footprint, including outcroppings and, you know, roof overhangs and things. So between 100 and 300 feet, maximum size of the boathouse, 2,000 square feet. That's pretty big. And if you have shoreline that exceeds 300 feet, then you can have a boathouse of up to 3,000 square feet, maximum size. In terms of your height, if your boathouse has a flat roof, which many of the double-deckers do, your maximum height is 20 feet. And if you have a pitched roof, the maximum height of your boathouse is 28 feet, basically three stories. Boathouse protrusion guidelines. If you're in a cove, your boathouse cannot extend more than one-third of the way out and that of course that makes sense just so boats other boaters can can get in and out um, of the cove without you blocking it and if you are if your boathouse your property is not on a cove if you're just extending out into the main part of the lake your boathouse cannot go farther than 150 feet from the shoreline 150 feet and one point of clarification as to the square footage uh, limitations. Your walkway, some of the boathouses have a walkway 
that goes out to the boathouse. As long as the walkway is not larger than five feet in width, then that square footage of the walkway does not count towards your overall um, square footage of your boathouse calculation. So if I have a walkway that's four feet wide and it goes out, you know, 15 feet, uh, does that extra 60 feet of square footage count towards my boathouse calculations? The answer is no, it does not. So that's just some additional information. Hope it's helpful for you all to chew on. Uh, a big thanks again to Dominion Energy and to Stuart for being here. They were very generous with their time and for sending him and allowing him to participate in the interview. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed the uh, first episode of the Lake Anna podcast. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you guys soon.